All righty, all righty. How you feeling, FCM? Up in the house. Great to see y'all. And it's great for us to, to bring sexy back. I'm about to start singing a Justin Timberlake song oh, right now. Please don't. But, uh, please spare us. <laughs> Victoria's Secrets. I like it. I like the name of the title. I mean, February is romance, the love month. And uh, so we'll be talking about atmosphere, the power of atmosphere and love and a little bit of sex and how we got together. And, uh, but we also, before we get started a little bit further uh, along, we want to welcome the Giddings Campus. Can y'all put your hands together for the Giddings Campus that's joining us? Welcome, man. Glad you guys are here with us. And uh, we are delighted to see all the guests that are here. And Raquel and the team always do an incredible job. And the volunteers. And come on, give yourselves a hand for just making this church go forward. I love it. What God is doing here. Love, love, love it. Love it. Well, we are so excited to be with you today. We love your pastors. Um, we think of them as uh, one of our best friends, yeah. and we just love what the work that God has done through them and through you guys here in this area. And we are just super pumped on this Super Bowl Sunday, right? There's something big happening today, like little, some game or something. A little yeah. small game. Only a billion people watch it. Yeah. Uh, we're going to probably eat a lot of junk food today because you've made your resolutions in January and, you know, those are worn off already. So, hey, bring on the mozzarella sticks and the, you know, what is the chicken wings that we eat? Yeah, and everything that's not well, good for you. But uh, how yeah. many of you guys don't care about the Super Bowl at all? How many know there's a football game on going on today? Uh, how I'm rooting for the Cowboys. Uh, no, they're not going to. They're definitely not. Yeah, no. And go Broncos. Any Panthers fans up in the house? And, uh, okay, that's weak. Uh, of course, all the way. Giddings is going to see this next weekend. They're going to know actually who wins. So, anyway, we're yeah. talking about the Super Bowl today. And, uh, but, anyhow, this is kind of a mozzarella table. I kind of like this uh, for it's us a to... Mozz it's yeah, made out of cheese. Like, yeah, well, well, we're just kind of ordering some appetizers and kind of having dinner or lunch with our Funny friends thing, here he today. always orders mozzarella sticks at, at Sonic, but he calls them marinara sticks and mozzarella sauce. He yeah, can I'll never always, get it right. I always get it wrong. They, they're like, what? What? <laughs> well, this is our family, and uh, maybe you haven't seen our awesome kids. We call them our yeah. little chicken McNuggets. Uh, anyway, there's Joel, and there's Jenna, and uh, our dog is like posing for that picture, which I think yeah. is pretty awesome. His name is, is Sam, and uh, Brooke and I have been, uh, let me get started on the right foot, we've been married for 14 years, right? I don't want to get that wrong. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, just, um, you know, there's just kind of some dynamics on how we began the dating process, but before we get to that, I'd like to just brag on, uh, I mean, she's freaky fine, first of all. Uh, I'm, I'm madly in love, I mean, just look at her. I don't her. think I that's mean, a compliment. I mean, know. her looks, and the way she cooks, and the way she does mom, and uh, the way she does wife and family, I just am so, she must have been blind, I'm so blown away that she picked me. Uh, she was a valedictorian back in the day. And um, never made, honestly, she's never made less than an A her whole life, all the way through high school and all this college. And uh, so my kids are smart because of her. And they're like, well, what happened to you? And I'm like, that ain't nothing. I never made a B either. <laughs> Don't be judging me. Don't bug me. But uh, anyway, she was a state champion softball pitcher. And... Uh, turned down a lot of Division I full scholarships, um, you know, because you, you met me. I entered your world and everything turned right side up. That's how that rolled. It's probably the least smart thing she's ever done. She's probably like wishing, I wish I would have taken the scholarship <laughs> instead of marrying you. But um, I just can't brag on her uh, enough. And uh, why don't you just talk about kind of how we, it sounds illegal, it sounds more scandalous than it actually was, but he was my youth pastor, and I was... A, she was in the youth group, youth group, and I was her youth pastor. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's, it sounds so he like came, I need to be taken I, to jail. Yeah. I grew, I grew up in Oklahoma. He grew up in Louisiana, in New Orleans, so he's a total city boy, and I'm from the country. Right. And we met in Arkansas, and we live in Texas. <laughs> I was like... like we but, got uh, here as fast as we could. But I lived on the border of um, Oklahoma, Arkansas, so I went to church in Arkansas. And he, my senior year, he took the job at the church that I was attending the youth group, and yeah, he was my youth pastor. But we didn't start dating until I was in college, 
and all that, and that's another story in itself. And he made me break up with my boyfriend. He used the because he was a loser. Card. It was like he's unequally the yoked. You yeah. know that unequally yoked she thing. She dropped anyway. it like it was hot. <laughs> It was a good decision. It was and the right decision. I called her in. I called her into the office, and uh, our youth group was growing, and uh, he was a loser, like a total dud, and uh, I'm not going to mention his name. I said, hey, I, pay, I played the youth pastor card. Hey, come on in. I want to sit down with you. Our youth group is blowing and glow, glowing and growing, and, uh, and we're tearing it up for God. I need some good quality youth leaders, you know, to help us go to the next level. And I was thinking about you. I was actually just trying to get a meeting with her. So anyway, and I said, hey, how's it going with your, with your guy? And uh, well, we've been dating for four years, and I'm trying to get him saved and all this kind of stuff or whatever. And I said, yeah, just look, open up your eyes. Right in front of you is all you ever need. <laughs> All you ever want is right here. Just masculinity in the flesh. It. And then you started singing what, Backstreet Boys to me. Uh, no. <laughs> well, I told, You're getting off the notes. Well, okay, I told her. I said, just say bye, <laughs> bye, bye to him. And, so, and she did. Bye, bye. And I said, he'll come back and he'll say, I'm going to change, I'm going to change. And I said, you just say, I'm not taking you back. I got sexy back. I got Paul now. So anyway. Okay. And you did. You made this good choice, I think. My opinion. <laughs> All right, well, we're here to talk to you today about marriage, <laughs> and we're, uh, we're actually are super excited about the word that we feel like the Lord is going to, um, you know, place on your hearts today, and we want to talk about the power of atmosphere, and atmosphere is such an important yeah. thing um, in all aspects of our life, especially in our marriage, so can you... Tell us what atmosphere is. Yeah, I mean, atmosphere sets the tone uh, for your home. And uh, I just kind of say it this way, atmosphere that you allow or the atmosphere that you create in your marriage. Of course, I know that there's people who are not married here, not married yet. Uh, so this is kind of, we're talking about healthy relationships today and a healthy uh, atmosphere. And, you know, when you have an atmosphere that you allow, it determines the product that you produce. And you don't see polar bears hanging out in Cancun. That's a bad atmosphere. Uh, you don't you put, you know, a gallon of milk and 103 degrees on the front porch in Texas heat. It's going to spoil. That atmosphere is not conducive for milk. A fish, we've, ever, we've always heard, you know, a fish out of water is not a right atmosphere. So there's right atmospheres. There's wrong atmospheres. There's good atmospheres. There's there's bad atmospheres, and the atmosphere is, is such a huge thing uh, as it relates to our relationship, and God started with atmosphere. Sprite says thirst is everything, but I, I think that that's not the right case. Uh, atmosphere is everything. God started Eden with an atmosphere, four rivers, a tree of life sky, creation, all these things, man. And then out of man, he took a bone out of a woman. Come on, turn to your spouse right now and say, hey, you're my bone. You know what I'm saying? So there's man, there's woman, there's, and God looked at all of this stuff and he said, that's good, man. That's good. You're knocking it out of the park. That's very good. It's a good atmosphere. Uh, and then he stepped back. He stepped back and he, he says, there's something that's not good about the atmosphere. And that is that there's just a man without a woman and two are better than one. Yeah. They're, they're better together, but it's not good that Adam, you're just doing it solo by yourself. That's not the healthiest environment. And so God, the goal of God is to get all of our relationships and the goal of God in our marriage is to get us back to uh, the garden. And actually the word Eden uh, means fruitfulness. It means well watered. It means, uh, you can say victorious. Uh, it means fruitful. And I think that every single one of us here uh, would say, hey, I want a fruitful relationship with the Lord or with the person I'm dating or the person that you're married to. And and does it look like that? And I think atmosphere is huge. And so atmosphere is everything, but atmosphere is not ultimate. Now hear me, uh, God had to be in the middle of the right atmosphere yeah. for that relationship to go well. And when they pushed God out, then the atmosphere went bad and God said it's not good and they got banished from the garden. But God was walking smack dab in the middle of that atmosphere. So atmosphere in your home, what does it feel like? What does it look like? It feels like something to your kids, if you have kids and you're yeah. a parent. It feels like either death or it might feel like 
life. Have you ever had somebody who just straight up just walked into a business meeting or walked into some sort of environment and they just kind of lit up the room? Yeah. Uh, you know, Pastor Chris and Melissa are real deal. I mean, when they walk into a room, it's contagious. It, like it lights up the atmosphere, their passion. We walk into some churches and they're dead. It's, it's, a, it's a wrong, it's a bad, it's an unhealthy atmosphere. And then you walk into FCM, Giddings, and Bastrop, come on, holla, and all of a sudden there's passion, and there's fruitfulness, and there's, and there's light. It's an, it's an atmosphere for God to move. And when Jesus, who could do everything and can do anything, he was very God, he would walk straight into some atmospheres and he would smell and he would get a sniff and a whiff of no faith at all. And even God could not do many miracles or some little small few miracles or healings because there was not an atmosphere of faith. And so we want the power of atmosphere, that would be healthy, that it would be yeah. good, it would be righteous, it would be holy, it would be passionate uh, in our relationships and in our marriage. But God has to be in the middle yeah. to where he's walking in and among Adam and Eve, so to speak. Yeah, and let's yeah. be honest with one another. Sometimes our marriages don't feel like the Garden of Eden. Yeah. You know, it's not like always the best atmosphere and there's good, the bad, the ugly that happens um, on a day-to-day -day basis. But God says, I can take all of that, good, bad, rocky start, great start, wherever you are in your life right now, in your relationships, God can take it and work it for the good. It tells us that in Romans, that God takes all things and works them for the good. So from this point on, God wants to, yeah. to give you the tools and to equip you and do a work in your marriage so that your atmosphere can be healthy, so that things can live and thrive. Even if you started off with a kind of a weird atmosphere like we did when, whenever we got married. Um, oh, no, it was big time weird. Yeah. He, <laughs> I, I was a virgin. She was a virgin. So it, we didn't know what the, we, we didn't have a clue. That was weird, you know, too. Of but, what to um, do but he, on our first night. Yeah. So he, what? So we had a great wedding and keeping it real. We uh, it was wonderful, and we were going to go to Cancun the next day, but we didn't want to drive all the way to Dallas for to the airport that night. So we we got a hotel in this place in Oklahoma, and um, it had a jacuzzi tub, you know, in the room and everything. Hey, <laughs> fire! Stop! I told you not to do that. So anyway, um, <laughs> we uh, so I went to the to the bathroom to kind of freshen up, you know, it'd been a long day. And then I come out and I smell something weird. It like smells like medicine, like your medicine cabinet, you know? I'm I was like, trying to create an atmosphere. What? <laughs> I was like, what in the world am I smelling? And there's a look and bubbles are like overflowing in the jacuzzi tub. And he had taken head and shoulders. <laughs> yeah. Well, back then he had a, a little bit more hair in this area and he had dumped practically the whole bottle of head and shoulders because right. we didn't have any bubbles they didn't have bubbles he's like we got to have bubbles so <laughs> this is bad anyways he he just squirted it all out and, and it a lot smelled. of bubbles because okay didn't you know you head and shoulders smells like a prescription shampoo you know so anyway mm -mm. that was not a good atmosphere for so me. yeah so it started off ugly i mean I mean, you weren't ugly. <laughs> I mean, you were pretty. It's getting worse. I was ugly, which was why we needed a whole lot of bubbles. But the first couple of weeks, it was rocky. I mean, it was not a beautiful atmosphere as we were trying to figure it out. We say all that to say that we're not experts no. uh, in what we're going to share with you guys on how to have a healthy relationship or a healthy marriage. Uh, and we're not sexperts either or experts at all. But just some things I believe that we've discovered along the way out of Mark 5. I think there's four thoughts um, if you want to jot down some things on how if it's ugly, God can bring it back to the garden and make it beautiful and fruitful uh, in our yeah. lives. And, and God was really big about this atmosphere. He wanted to produce an atmosphere of faith and not fear and not doubt. And we're going to look at a passage of scrip scripture in Mark chapter 5. Um, it's not really, you wouldn't think about it as being a marriage scripture, but I think there's some key ingredients yeah. here that we can pull out of this story of what we can apply in our, not just our marriages, but in all of our relationships. Yeah. We were talking to a mother and a daughter after the first service, and they said these were amazing for our relationship, um, just to open yeah. the door for some different things. And so let's see what God says about atmosphere here. We're going to start in verse 35. It says, uh, 
while he was still speaking, this is Jesus. He's walking through the crowds. He had just healed the lady with the issue of blood. Um, and this, this man, Jairus, who's an official, sent some people to come because his daughter um, was sick and was dying. And so it says, while he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? So the daughter, the daughter had died. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. That's really important. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and said, and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. So you got, he's coming to this house and this, this little girl's dead and she's 12 years old and all these people are around the house, this crowd, and they're like, what? crying and wailing and and just being like like a Jerry Springer episode you know like (laughs) you are not the father you know ah, you know all that drama is really what it is right and so they're weeping and they're wailing and then when he came in he said to them why make this commotion and weep the child is not dead but sleeping and they ridiculed him. Some translations say they laughed at him. Mm-hmm. So you got this roller coaster of emotions, weeping, wailing, crying, laughing, just like drama central. Um, and, but he, he had to put them all outside. He's like, Mm-mm, this isn't the right atmosphere. You guys have to go. He said he took the father and the mother of the child and those that were with him, which are Peter, James, and John, and entered where the child was laying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumai, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know about it, and he said that something should be given to her to eat. So we're going to talk today, this is a powerful scripture, about a life that's been transformed. Maybe your marriage needs to come back to life. And we feel like there are some key components, key ingredients um, for a healthy atmosphere in your marriage. And the first one is you have to believe the best. So you need to believe the best in the situation. Jesus spoke to these people. They said, the girl's dead. Don't even bother coming anymore. Like you waited too long to come. Now she's dead. And he said, no, don't be afraid. Only believe we have to believe the best in one another. A lot of times we, we think, sometimes we, we just kind of get so used to one another. We, we think we're on the wrong team. We're like on opposite teams, but we are on the same team. Yes. We're in this together and we want to win together, but we have a tendency because of our upbringing or because of our past relationships to view things through this lens of fear, of insecurity, of wounds, of hurt. And we assume the worst in a situation. So what lens do you see things through? God, God wants to change our lens. God wants us to see through love. So when he comes to me and he says something that maybe he brings a challenge to me or, or brings um, a correction to me, he's doing it out of love. But we all of a sudden put up walls and we're like, oh no, you know, you're attacking me because we see it through a lens of insecurity. And God wants us to see it through love. And he wants us to s- assume the best in one another. And there's a word for people that, that um, and I think all of us are guilty at s- one time or another, of seeing the worst case scenario in everything. Right. Right? It's called awfulist. Like the word awful and ist. It's a person that sees the worst case scenario. So a practical example would be a few years ago, I had this friend and she was horrible at texting. Okay. So I didn't know that at the time we started becoming friends and I would text her, Hey, thinking about you today. Hey, you want to hang out this and that? And no response like ever. I'm like, what is up? I know she has a phone because when I'm with her, she's on it. Like she's looks at her phone, never, you know, she just, every once in a while she'd respond here and there, but it was just I was like, what is it? Is it me? And so then when we would get together, I would be awkward because I'm like, you won't text me back, but now you're my friend. And I don't know. This is just women. Women, you get me, right? Men are probably like, what is she talking about up there? But <laughs> you get it, right? You overanalyze things. And it c- come to find out, I had created this whole scenario in my mind that she didn't like me. She didn't want to be close to me. But really, her daughter had been deleting her text messages. Her little, she had a little girl. She just text messaged, 
you know, keep playing our little games. And so we, like, that was totally not even worth my time to worry about. But I put thought bubbles over people's heads. And sometimes we do it. We're all guilty of that. Mm -hmm. Somebody gives us a look. We put a thought bubble. We're like, oh, they don't like me. They yeah. think my outfit's ugly. They think I'm ugly. They think I'm stupid. Don't put thought bubbles over people's heads. Let them ask them, hey, is there something going on? Like, open those lines of communication. Don't assume the worst. They might just not have anything in the bubble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, you know, they might not be thinking. I'm it's just a kidding. safe I'm just assumption kidding. with husbands that we're just <laughs> pretty much not thinking at any time. No, but we, you know, we want to assume the best in, in our spouse. Well, and it happened with Peter in the Bible. And, and Peter, the Bible says, and he saw the wind and he saw the waves. Like, okay, I get it. You saw the waves. You saw the wind? R really? You got superpowers, Peter? I mean, how'd you pull that one off, Peter? Anybody can see the wind in here? And what we do is we make, you know, mountains out of molehills. And we all of a sudden, we become awfulist and we say, you always do this. Yeah. And we begin to start competing with one another instead of complimenting one another. But we're better together as a team. If we lose, we lose together. If we win, we win together. And so I open up the door with Brooke and I give her permission to go there. Because I know that she's for me and not against me. And so I'll say, how am I doing as a husband? La, 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 la. And I know that she's going to give me some honest feedback and then I can't draw thought bubbles over her head saying she's a jerk. I can't be insecure. I've got to know and believe the best and not fear. And so God is the only one who can change out our our filter for fear and make it a filter for faith to believe that when she says hey, you're, you're doing pretty good, but you can work on some of these areas that all of a sudden I don't draw battle lines because she shared something honest with me. I've got to believe the best that I trust her, we're on a team, and when she shares that, it's gonna make me a better husband. It's gonna make me a better leader. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Come on, FCM. And so we have to get honest with some of these, some of these issues. And God can change the heart. And I think it kind of leads to the next thing is, is, uh, is secondly, kick the negative out kick the negative out in order for you to have a healthy relationship and for your life to propel into God's purpose. Verse 40, he looked at some of this drama right. and some of this commotion and, uh, and he said, I've got to get that outside. Right. I, I can't circumstantially and even the relationships that were there, it might've been, we don't know, it might've been some close relationships that were there, but he had to take a strong, even make some hard choices to say, I need an atmosphere by which I can move to wake up this dead daughter and give her life again. But in order for me to have this right, healthy atmosphere, there's some things that have got to go. Yeah. And he kicked the people out. He was not a man pleaser. And so when we look at some of the relationships that we have that might be hindering your relationship, you got to take an, an inventory of some of that because some of those outside relationships may be hindering your relationship and your relationship with God. It might be breaking it down instead of building it up. It, not, it might not be an encouragement for you on a trajectory to go to the next level. All of us want to go to the next level, but we got to look at some things and sometimes make some brutal choices to walk away from some fatal distractions and maybe some fatal attractions and say, you got to go. Yeah. I want a miracle, the recipe for a miracle to happen in my home and it's not going to thrive right. and be fruitful with some of these Debbie Downers in my life. And some of these friends and acquaintances that are going, nah, 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 like all this kind of stuff on Facebook and social media, news cycle, and all this kind of drama and negativity that's gravitationally pulling you down and causing splinters and wedges yeah. and walls between you and your wife. And you got to look at some of those things and not be intimidated by it. Look at some of the friendships in your life. Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. It happens every time. And for you to go to the next level, you need some friends around you that will give you some lift. God's called you to be an eagle, but you're never going to soar like an eagle if you're hanging around with the turkeys. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I believe I can fly. 
Woo! I believe I can touch the sky. All right, so look, it's not gonna happen. You are the sum average of the five closest friends in your life. And some of them have got to go. Yeah. And not in a rude way, but at 19 years old, when I knew God was calling me to be an eagle and to be called to ministry and be in leadership, and I did not want to be alive and not make impact. Yeah. Mm. I did not want to be breathing and not make an impact on my generation and make a difference. But I knew my three closest friends, and I can name all three of them, at 19 years old were not providing lift for the purpose of God in my life. And I had to have a conversation with them yeah. and say, hey guys, in a nice way, look, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be moving to San Antonio to go to Bible college in about six hours. Hey, it's been great hanging out with you guys, but I'm hooking up with some other friends and I moved from New Orleans that night, six hours later and got in my Toyota Tercel and went to San Antonio and began to start seeing God take my life off at the next level. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But I had to kick some stuff out. Yeah. Get the negative out. Yeah, and, and a lot of times we dwell on the negative in our, um, in our spouse. Like sometimes we, we look and we'll focus like a spotlight. We'll focus on their negative qualities. You know, probably the thing that attracted you to your husband or your wife initially was your differences. That's true. You know, they talk yeah. about how opposites right. attract. You probably were like, man, you know, maybe you're the type of person that plans everything out and has to have it go so much. And they're like really spontaneous. And that attracted you to them. They were exciting. They had a lot of energy. And then once you get married, now all of a sudden you want them to be just like you. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, hey, let's just go do this today. Well, I didn't, that's not on my plan. And you've got to follow this, you know, and then all of a sudden you get mad at them because of the thing that attracted you to them. And so a lot of times we focus on those negative things. Mm -hmm. I did this just last week. My sister Hannah's in town um, staying with us for a little bit. And I was like, hey, we're going to go shopping. We're going to go to the store. And Paul's like, yeah, go ahead. I'll take care of the kids. And they had homework. And he was, I was like, are you going to feed them? He's like, yeah, I'll cook them something. You know, Everything Paul cooks is yellow. Okay. I'm that, serious. This is true. Or orange is yellow, like macaroni and cheese, popcorn, Limpton noodle soup, eggs. Ramen. This, these are, this is his repertoire. Yeah. Grilled cheese sandwiches, ramen, yeah. Yep. So anyway, that's about it. That's all he knows to cook. But he's and like, I'll, I'll whip him up something here. Yep. And so he fed them. He even cleaned the counters. Yes, I did. You know, but he's... <laughs> Okay, so I walk in, and I'm like, this is great. You know, the kids, you know, they, they've had a bath and all this, and what's in the sink? You know, I, I mean, I didn't say it like that, but I'm thinking to myself, why does he just do this? Every time he does the dishes or he cleans the kitchen, he just piles the dirty dishes in the sink. And he says it's because he has to get them off the counter to clean the counter. But then I'm like, okay, but that's not the last thing you have to do when you're cleaning the kitchen. We have a dishwasher. Open, open put in, you know? And so anyway, that's all I focused on. And right. then I was, I had to kind of step myself out of the situation and say, think about all the positive things he did, all the things he did for the family. And the one thing that you're focusing on, the first thing I said, why didn't you finish the job is the one negative thing. And that's what we tend to do is we highlight the negative. And in first Corinthians 13, yeah. it talks about Love keeps no records of wrong. Mm -hmm. We need to start keeping records of right. Mm -hmm. So I, but you have to train yourself. I had to train myself to be like, thank you for doing the homework. Thank you for feeding the children eggs and macaroni and cheese. <laughs> thank you for cleaning the counter. I can handle this little piece. Well, and it gets back to believing the best and, and kicking out and not highlighting the negative uh, issues. And, and so, which kind of leads to the third thought here of what Jesus did in verse 40. He didn't just kick the negative out, but then he put the positive in. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he, he got five new people, uh, maybe the five before he had to kick out in order for a miracle to happen. And he grabbed the father and he grabbed the mother and he grabbed Peter, James, and John. And he goes, I got a new circle. Yeah. And if you don't have a strong circle, you'll, your whole life will go in circles. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll come back next year 
and you guys will still be complaining about the same or marriages will still be having frustration issues a year, five years later unless you start looking at what am I getting out? How am I believing? What are my believing powers and what am I putting in? And these are the changes that I think that God wants to make for us to have a healthy uh, relationship because he had to have a quality in these guys to say, I need y'all to provide an atmosphere of faith before we enter into this room to bring a resurrection in her life. And so that's the ingredients for a miracle to, to happen. And also, whenever you have these positive relationships, what you put these positive relationships in. You can't just kick the negative out and then not fill it with something. You know, life can't live in a vacuum. You're, you're going to be drawn down. The gravity of this world will constantly pull you down if you're not filling it back up with the right relationships. And if you're a married couple, yeah. you need someone, you need to confide in your spouse. You need to have that open line of communication. But as a woman, I need women in my life that I can take my mask off with, okay? Because what happens is secrets make you sick. And when you're harboring secrets and when yeah. you're harboring like hurts or wounds or maybe something he did that really hurt my feelings, but I just stuffed it down and I never talked about it, that you can't get healing in that. And it builds a wedge in your relationships. And so as a man, he needs people in his life that he can go to and say, hey, man, I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with this issue. And how did you overcome this issue? And as a married couple, we need other married couples yes. yep. that we can look to that have walked, maybe been married longer than us, that we can ask, hey, what do you do in this situation? Or parenting, like how you have an awesome teenage boy, but we have a 10-year-old, and it's like, how did you get past fifth grade, you know? So you can ask people for this advice and be willing to go there with people. Yeah. And vulner be vulnerable with people. Well, and there's opportunities to confess or cover up. Yeah. Every day we can make choices. And sometimes we make the bad choice because wrong voices feed into wrong choices, but right voices feed into right choices uh, in our life. And so that's why we have to have the Peter, James, and John, that small circle of people, our connection groups and our discipleship groups, and we're getting real. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, boots on the ground as it relates to, can you help me? And I want to help you and encouraging uh, one another because a, a threefold cord is not easily broken. Two are better than one, but three is better than two when God is in the middle yeah. of the two. And he wants our lives to go better and to be uh, blessed in that way. And so we have an opportunity. And, and what happened was what caused the garden experience with Adam and Eve to become fruitless instead of fruitful is that they chose to do what? Hide. Cover up. Yeah. They chose to, to hide instead of confess. Uh, and so confession brings freedom and, yeah. and victory when you get the secrets mm -hmm. out. You will not be victorious if you're holding secrets that's right. and, and hiding. That's good. And so that's why James 5.16 says, confess your faults and your trespasses one to another so that you may be healed. Now, we get forgiveness from God. It's the greatest bar of soap scripture in the Bible. If you confess your sins to God, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all cleanse, us from all unrighteousness. We get yeah. forgiveness from God, but you get healing. You get healing when you confess your sins one to another. So what does that look like in your life to where you can bear your soul, get vulnerable and honest, and God just has a tendency to draw near to that honest, contrite heart, and then right. victory begins to start welling up and mm -hmm. springing up in your life. And so all of us want victory, but we gotta, what are we doing with the secrets in our life? Who's your small group? Who's your Peter, James, and John that you can say, hey, man, I'm struggling? What does that look like in your life on a day-to-day -day basis? And that can, can show you and to model um, and, and to encourage you when you're struggling. Encourage you. Encourage means put courage in. Yeah, that's good. Encourage. Yeah. So if I'm feeling down and if I'm feeling, oh, I can't overcome this. I just can't. Somebody needs to be there and say, yes, you can. You got this. I'm going to, you, I'm going to give you courage. Be brave. Do the hard thing. And God will meet you there. God will completely meet you there. And I have to encourage him because 
Here's the truth of and, the and matter. You're great. you're great at it. You're great. And we might yeah. be competitive people in nature. Like we have these Fitbit things and I'm like, hey, hey, I'm beating you. But we're, yeah. but we're not competitive in our marriage because if he wins, I win. Yeah. And if I win, he wins. Yeah, and you can win an so, argument and lose a marriage. Yeah. So it's not about that. Good. It's not about the battle. It's about coming together to be better. Right. In that way. And she is, I call her my CEO. She's my chief encouragement officer. <laughs> she makes up stuff. When I'm a bad dad, y'all, all you women have mojo. <laughs> y'all have like the power to trick your man into becoming like, I, I feel like I'm a genius and I know I'm not. When I'm around her, I, I feel like, okay, I, today I wasn't, I really fumbled on being a father. I was good in some other areas today, but fumbled in the area of fatherhood. I'll walk in and kind of feel, you know, I need to spend more time with my kids and stuff. And she will just straight up large doses of encouragement, like, you're the greatest dad in the world. Really? Wow. I'm, how? Because I didn't really feel like I was the greatest dad. How am I doing that? You came home. Like she makes up stuff and it makes you feel better. And so women, make up stuff and make your husband. It's, it's awesome, especially when you hear that encouragement to put courage into when you hear it from your spouse, those that are closest to you. Yeah. It's huge. It's great. Yeah. So it kind of leads to number four, healthy communication, I think is the last one. Uh, and the healthiest communication is the one that the other person hears healthy communication. And this is what Jesus did in this story. How many of you have ever heard of the five love languages of healthy communication? Gary Chapman, it, it, go get that book. Uh, it's really awesome as it relates to relationships and marriage. But he basically breaks it down this way. Uh, he said there's five essential love languages. I think there's six because food is, is one of them. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's, it's physical touch. Come on, somebody. Uh, it's verbal affirmation, which are my top two. Uh, as I'm kind of reading this, you guys kind of be thinking about your spouse and yourself as well. Uh, receiving gifts, quality time, and acts of service. And I'm, I'm physical touch and verbal affirmation, which basically means I want her to touch me a lot and tell her, tell me how awesome I am all the time. And so that, yeah. that's my, my two things, but, but that's not her two things. Yeah, I'm quality time. So I yeah. think if we're just spending time together, he knows I love him and you know, I'm, yeah. and, and I, I will... I'm also words of affirmation. So that one I do more, you know, just like, hey, I love spending time with you and stuff like that. But if I'm not touching him, like we'll be driving there, just, just put your hand on my shoulder or something. Like yeah. he'll just have to say that because I have a bubble. Yeah. In fact, and you, I'm could, a, you could touch me right now while you're preaching. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, like that, I have to get out, out of my comfort zone or he's not hearing that right. language, you know. So I have to kind of break out of my, my comfort zone zone and my, um, burst my bubble a little bit mm. to show him in it, love in the way that he receives it. And so if we go a long time without spending time together, I start, you know, I'm like, Hey, are you, are we all right? You know? And, and he can tell, he's like, you know, we haven't really had a date night in so long and she needs some quality time. Cause that's really my, my thing. So I want to speak a language that other people understand yeah. in order for you to click in your relationship, not how I filter things with the top two that I have, but what are the top two on her? So I'm wanting physical touch and verbal mm -hmm. affirmation. She's wanting quality time. And I thought, I fall my, into this syndrome of you know, I, I believe it, when you look at Abraham and Sarah, yeah. Sarah was a quality time person in the Bible. And Abraham was busy with his work. So his work language was acts of service. And he was always busy at his job, doing life at the speed of life. And so in Genesis chapter 18, it says of Abraham, and this is like typical men, uh, it says nine times in Genesis 18 that Abraham hurried here. He hurried there. He hurried to his herd. He hurried to his cattle. He was, he was so busy that he was in his own world. And he wasn't in Sarai's world, which was quality time. And so God had to literally give Abraham a commercial break and stop him. And the Bible says, and Abraham finally sat down from doing all of his work. And when he sat down, God got through to him. And so what your wife has been nagging you about for months and months and months, God can whisper in one moment and turn the whole thing around. And he has to sit Abraham down because we're all hard-headed just like Abraham. And he sits down and God starts talking to Abraham. And what's the question? 
God asks Abraham a question and he says to him, where's your wife? And this is a typical dude. This is Paul Mason. This is a typical dude probably in here. This is what he says. She's in the tent. (laughs) And God's not saying, look, bonehead, I'm not asking geographically where she is. Oh, she's in the kitchen. She's with the kids. She's at Kohl's shopping. That's such a typical, because we're in our own world. No wonder our relationships are not victorious. We're not thinking about Sarai needs quality time, and I'm in a hurry all the time. And so where's your wife? She's in the tent. And God's trying to get through and penetrate into his hard head of saying, let me just stop you just for a moment because I want a blessed relationship to come out of this. Where's your wife emotionally? Where's your wife spiritually? Where's your wife? Do you talk about dreams? Do you talk about devotions? Do you talk about spiritually? There's no spiritual intimacy happening between you and Sarai because you're in your own world. And that's the gap, that's the distance that, in fact, the devil fills in the blanks on the distance. And God wants us to pull the splinter out. Yeah, because God spoke the earth into... To bring reconciliation. God spoke the earth into existence when it was void. And so if you have void, allow God to speak into that void and to speak life into that. And I love how... We see in this passage that, that Jesus did all these love languages yeah, to this five. little girl. Yep. He touched her. He spoke to her. He prayed for her. He told her to arise. He spent time with her. He served her. He gave her the gift of life. Like all of these languages are here because it was an atmosphere and an environment of faith. And I don't know where you are in your relationships, in your marriage, Um, in your relationships, in your family home, in your life. But God, what you might say, you might have come in here and said, oh, it's dead. There's, I'm just tired. You might have had a fight on the way to church and it's just dead. There's just, it's just void. There's wedge. It's too far gone. But what you might call dead, God says it's only sleeping. That'll preach. That'll preach. When we get God. That's That's great. Into a yeah. dead situation, yeah. he can bring life where there is no life. Yeah, that's great. From one word, that's that's he great. can speak. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't matter where you are from this moment on is where it matters. And, and God can come in and he can do a work and he can bring healing if we just ask and open ourselves up for it. I, I want us just to open up our hearts right now. In fact... Why don't we stand all over the room? We want to pray for you. Brooke's going to pray for you. Let's just open up our hands and open up our hearts one to another. And maybe you're not married here today. Maybe you're to be married. But maybe in your relationship with God. Hey, God can turn this whole thing around. I I love it how it says immediately. Immediately. A sudden break in of God that he can do something in just one moment, just as suddenly that happens. And a unity that comes between a spouse and, and, a, and a married couple that all of a sudden God begins to start blessing. And he wants our whole lives to go from strength to strength and from victory to victory and from glory to glory. And so it takes the supernatural. Without the supernatural, it will break down. You bring pressures back to the house. It's a pressure-filled atmosphere. It's going to break down your kids. It's going to break down your marriage. And that's the opposite of what God wants. He's a good God. He's a kind God. And he gives his strength in our times of weakness. We just have to invite him in. Simply, Jesus was invited to a party, and his very first miracle was at a wedding. And he turned some water into wine and he can take something that's in ashes and make it into something beautiful something that's ugly he can do something right now to get through the abrahams in our world in our lives and the guys and the women he can just do something very quickly to turn this whole thing around and so let's just extend our hands towards the lord open up our hearts god we just thank you lord that you are in the victorious business
And God, you are in the business of, it's your specialty, Lord, to come in and bring healing and bring miracles where it does not look like there's any kind of life at all. You just call it sleeping. And what we call an end, you're so powerful, God, that you call it a beginning. And we don't pray to Satan, but we do serve notice on Satan that you have to get your hands off of families, off of our kids, off of our spouse, off of those that we're in relationship with. We serve notice on you that the cross of Jesus Christ wiped you out 2,000 years ago. You can't ruin relationships. You are not going to, we're not going to permit you to ruin and bring devastation and bring down relationships. But God, we call upon you. And Lord, where you're there, anything can happen and you're in the miracle working business in the name of Jesus we pray and everybody said amen to that come on let's give Jesus a hand in here God bless you we love you FCM